so very good morning to all of you and uh, thank you all for joining this webinar and thank you sun pharma for organizing this great event so today we'll be talking about a child with asthma who doesn't seem to respond now this clinical situation is not rare so a, a child with parents might just walk into your clinic and into your clinic and saying that you know my child is not doing well uh doctor help me help my child and the child seems to be on all drugs so the child seems to be on some inhaled steroids some long acting beta agonist some dalifalin like salts some montedeucast some nebulization is going on and often on the child is taking steroids as well so the clinical situation is 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 really confusing and this is the 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 situation of the doctor who is who is sitting across and he he actually doesn't clearly knows what is to be done so today we will talk about one such child who presented to us so with that child we will we'll just see how a child would present and how do you tease out the history the clinical examination and go on to a diagnosis and a certain why this child is not improving what is to be done regarding this child and then we'll go on to some some cases which will help us to understand that all that these is may not be asthma and then and then at the end we will we'll summarize a, a bit of literature and then end with some conclusions so let's go across with this with this child who presented to us last year so this is miss rim jim uh, who is 9 years old girl and who has been referred to us for her non improvement in asthma symptoms so if we look at the the clinical history in short she is a 9 years old girl she was well till approximately 3 years of age and then she started having episodes of cough which usually started after a cold and which went to the chest now initially these episodes were three or four times a year the child used to improve with nebulization and some oral medicines but now since 2017 so for the past two years the number of episodes have been increasing so instead of three or four episodes a year the child started having increased number of episodes so six to eight episodes a year and correctly the child was started on inhaled uh, inhaled steroids with bedesonide 400 microgram total dose now since january the the number of episodes have increased further so three or four episodes since january which have been requiring oral steroids so despite this child being on inhaled steroids this child doesn't seem to be doing well and when you examine this child the, the child is otherwise well the heart rates are normal the respiratory rates are normal and the child is wheezy so what is to be done in this situation right so this is not uncommon a child presenting to you with an as with with a with a history which is suggestive of possibly an asthma and the child is on you know is on a lot of drugs but the child doesn't seem to respond so what are we going to do about it right so let's go across and 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 evaluate this child in a bit of detail so what i would like to know further so i would like to you know describe one episode in detail so i would definitely like to tell them that is the is the cough productive or wet cough or is it a, is it a dry cough because sometimes you can be dealing with a bronchiectasis how does it begin with is it always virus induced episodes or even without a viral infection the child starts to wheeze and cough how many days the episode usually last and what medicines are required to about the episode so once we ask the mother you know the episodes are usually dry but sometimes they are wet during the course initially it starts with a cold but now even without cold she has episodes right they used to last for 5 to 7 days but now they're getting prolonged so they 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 might be lasting for 10 to 15 days and 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 these things are all important because if if you're dealing with asthma episodes then then prolonged episode prolonged cough is something which would which which makes you feel that this child possibly has asthma and and the child requires nebulization with steroid syrups as well so that tells you the gravity of situations now what else would i like to know so i would like to know the the information on severity of the episodes 
right? So how many times the child has been uh, required to go to the emergency in the hospital? Has the child ever been admitted in, in the hospital? Has she ever been admitted to the PIC? So when we ask the mother, she has required one or two ER visits in a year. She gets breathless and has to be taken to the emergency in the night. She has been admitted once three years back, that was in the ward. But last year she had a bad episode and she required an ICU admission. Now, we would like to know about seasonal variation because that is again typical of, an, of, of a bronchial asthma. And we would also like to know about what's happening towards severity. Is it, is it increasing? Is it the same? Or is it becoming better? That will help us to decide the treatment which we want. So, yes, there was seasonal. She used to be better in, 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 the, in the peak summer and the winters. But now, irrespective of season, Rim Jim has episodes. And then the mother feels that for the past one and a half years, the severity is, is getting up. So what else we would like to know? We would now like to see that what's happening to Rimjin in the past few months, right? So we have got a broad clinical picture that we know that yes, she is possibly an asthma. Uh, she started at three years of age. For the past six years, she has been having symptoms, often on ER visits, one ICU admission, one ward admission. But what has been happening to her daily life? So how many days a week on average, she gets symptoms of cough and breathlessness? How many nights she's not doing well? And does the asthma interfere with her exercise? Once we deal with, with these questions, we found out that she has daily symptoms now. The cough persists and increases with exercise. She used to play basketball, but she gets breathless now and she has stopped that. And twice a week, she has nighttime symptoms as well. So that tells us that she has possibly an asthma and this asthma is definitely poorly controlled. So as you know that there are two domains of asthma control, one is the current impairment and the other is the domain of risk. So she has definitely a lot of impairment in the current functioning. Right, now, in addition to the asthma symptoms, we would like to know about the comorbid conditions which the child might be having in association with the asthma. So we would like to know about the recurrent sneezing, nasal block, block nose and itchy nose, and how many hours per day the symptoms are troublesome. And does it affect the daily activity? So yes, she's having nasal symptoms for the past four to six months, almost daily symptoms, and three to four hours a day, she's not feeling as good. She's sneezing, especially in the morning. She's having a blocked nose, but not a runny nose. And she also complains of something going down the throat and increasing her cough. And that is possibly suggestive of a post-nasal trip. We also like to know about the mouth breathing, which tells us about the adenoids, any snoring, difficulty in sleeping. So we are looking at sleep apneas and any problems with speech and hearings, which can be associated with an adenoid hypertrophy, which we are trying to look at. So she had none of these problems. You would also like to know about what triggers her asthma when even smokes in the family, any, any irritants present in the, in the environment like DOs, perfumes, talcs, are they using any smokes smoky, in the family, coils, any, any irritants, and does she play in a dirty and a dusty environment? So yes, father occasionally smokes. She is fond of deos, perfumes. They're not sure about the school environment. And then we would definitely like to know about the medicines which she is, which she is using and how is she using. So very important question is inhalers. So when were they started? Who gives it? How often do you think the doses are missed? Are you using a spacer in, a, in, in, in association with your space? with your inhaler, how do you take it? And at the end, do you know what are the benefits of inhalational therapy? So she was started on inhalers last year when she got into the PICU. She is usually supervised by the mother, but now she feels that she's well-trained and Rim Jim is nine years and she can take the inhalers herself. Uh, how many doses are missed? Well, 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 doctor, I'm not sure she might be missing a few. 
but the mother is not supervising so she is not very sure and can't i can't she use a inhaler without a space a doctor i have seen it uh, in a lot of television serials and films she is quite grown up what is the use of the spacer and when we asked her that do you know about the benefits of inhalational therapy well uh, doctor we were asked to use inhalers you know uh, we were told they are good but um, and she pauses and says that you know they can be addictive you know that they have steroids and and my doctor who started said that they have to be taken at least for a year or even longer and uh, doctor do you think it, it cures her asthma so once you dig deeper into the history you realize that there are lots of things going on which you may not have realized which are which are on so although she has been started on inhalers there are lot of apprehensions in the mind of parents right mm -hmm. and that can be one of the reasons why this child doesn't seem to improve so let's go ahead and see what what's happening to dimjin so when you examine her her weight is fine she is well built her height is okay she has no other significant findings no atopic features her chest seems to be normal in shape and she has a bilateral polyphonic wheezing and you examine the other systems in detail so the, the cardiovascular the abdomen and the cns seems to be within normal limits now it's a part of our examination that we would always ask parents to show how you are taking your inhalers and um, let's see can we improve it we might be able to do that so uh, i can take i can take it well doctor there are no issues you know i have been trained well so that's the usual question the parents this is the usual answer which parents will give you but you know uh, we are also a bit adamant in all these things so you always tell them okay let's see we might be able to improve it and once she was taking her inhaler you know the the canister was empty she did not exhale well she did not inhale well once she had actuated the inhaler and she did not hold her breath well so we are we realized that there are lots of problems with the technique that might be a reason why jimjim is not improved so let's summarize rimjim here before we go on so so what we are thinking about is that what is the possible diagnosis are we all sure it is asthma and it is nothing else so do we have a possible differential diagnosis how would you classify her control do you think this is partially controlled well controlled or poorly controlled does she have any comorbid conditions and has the family received adequate asthma education so do they know about the disease do they know about diagnosis do they know about the dose of the drug to be given how it is to be given what are the delivery issues and do they know about trigger and allergen avoidance so we went ahead and investigated rimjim and the most important investigation in such scenarios would be to do a lung function test and this is a typical spirometry trace which you would find in a child with asthma now if you look at this graph carefully then you you can find two curves the blue one and the red one so the blue one is the pre bronchodilator curve and the red one is the post bronchodilator curve after we have given 400 micrograms of salbutamol so if we look at this graph then this graph appears to be slightly smaller in size and if you look at the shape of the curve then this part of the curve appears to be more of scooped so it shows a lot of scooping which tells us that this curve has obstruction and the post bronchodilator curve which is much better in shape and size and this scooping has gone and if you look at the values then look at the fpv1s and the fbcs and you can see that the fpv1 by fbcs are low the fpv1 by fbc ratios are reduced suggesting of obstruction and once you repeat them after giving a bronchodilator then you can find a significant reversibility in the fpv ones so it's it suggests a reversible airflow obstruction and that is consistent with the diagnosis of asthma in this particular child so finally 
with regard to rem gym we can conclude that she has an asthma there is no doubt about it we have a lung function which shows obstruction which shows reversibility she has comorbid conditions in the form of allergic rhino sinusitis and let's identify the reasons why she is not well so reasons for poor control could be poor adherence improper technique allergens which have not been taken care of comorbid conditions like allergic rhino sinusitis and she might be getting an inadequate drug doses and we might consider doing a step up of treatment So the family was given education regarding the diagnosis of asthma, the need for inhalation therapy, and the devices which are available. We reinforced the need for adherence to medicines. We demonstrated and checked the technique and did a trigger avoidance. So we added intranasal steroids for the comorbid allergic rhinitis, and at this moment we added LABA to the inhaled corticosteroids to make her better. and in addition all children with asthma especially if they have er visits or if they if they have admissions they would need an asthma action plan so ideally all patients would need and this asthma action plan has a green zone yellow zone as and as a red zone the green zone is doing well and they need to continue their medicines regularly even if they are well the yellow zone is when the asthma is getting a bit worse so what they are going to do about it and the red zone is a medical alert then what what are they going to do about it give a dose of prednisolone uh give bronchodilator every 20 minutes for three times and rush to a hospital and these are asthma action plan which are available everywhere and this is something which we use in our clinic in our hospital so uh once you have decided on what step of treatment you are going to put the child on you can step up or step down and this is the latest gina table uh, for 6 to 11 years of age children so you have step 1 to step 5 so step 1 could be either no treatment or sos short acting beta agonist but sometimes people advocate that low dose inhaled steroid should be added step 2 is daily low dose inhaled corticosteroids the options the alternate options but not as good options could be montelukast step 3 is low dose steroids with laba or medium dose steroids step 4 would be a medium dose steroid with laba and might need an expert advice and step 5 is a poorly controlled child on these steps of treatment which requires expert opinion and you might be dealing with a severe asthma so these are the steps which we have talked about now for older children more than 12 years of age uh the steps are a bit similar uh the only difference is that at step 1 we have good data to suggest that sos ics formetrol can be used or low dose ics with saba can be used so that is the new gina change which has happened and the rest of the steps remain nearly the same now what happened to rimjin so we were looking at improvement in symptoms breakthrough symptoms rescue saba sleep disturbance school absenteeism what happened to a physical activity the satisfaction of the family regarding treatment the compliance and the technique so she had good improvement in her in her symptoms there were no breakthrough symptoms uh she did not require saba there was no sleep disturbance she was going to school properly she could play and they were quite satisfied taking their treatment properly and the technique was good so after 3 months she was shifted to plain corticosteroids so if you remember we had added laba so we had stepped down after 3 months uh and then after 6 months she was shifted to low, low dose inhaled corticosteroids so which was again a step down from the medium dose which she was on and she was also given an asthma action plan now just a small word regarding children who are under 5 uh so we know that you can have a mixed bag hair 
you can have few children who have asthma who few children who do not have asthma so gina has given a very easy symptom based approach which which tells you about the probability of a particular child having asthma so on your left you have symptoms like short duration uri followed by a wheeze a few episodes in a year like two or three in a year and no symptoms between episodes so very few of them will have asthma now as the the duration of episodes increases more than 10 days of for each episode more than three episodes in a year severe episodes and even in between episodes the child keeps having symptoms then the chances of asthma increases and some will have asthma now as you go on to the right side as you can see the symptoms are longer number of episodes are more than 3 a year in between episodes the child still has cough wheeze heavy breathing and in addition they have allergen sensitization seen by a skin prick test atopic dermatitis food allergy or family history of asthma so they have given a lot of weightage to the family history and an atopic background for a particular child and in such situations most children will have asthma you can do a lung function in young children as well so this is something uh, which is now used for long times uh, and available even in india so this is an equipment which is called as an impulse oscillometer so this is a loudspeaker which produces sound voice uh, sound waves these go across here to the pneumothorax and the child is holding on to this mouthpiece and breathing and the and the breathing of this child gets superimposed on the sound waves and in in totality it is picked up with the pneumotac and you get your results so it will give you something different than the traditional spirometries which we are looking at so it gives you resistance and it gives you reactants and there would be lot of children where we would find that the spirometries are normal so for example this is a 6 years old child who had suspected asthma frequent symptoms required nebulization but spirometries are normal but when we investigated this child further we found that the impulse oscillometries shows significant obstruction and reversibility so these are the r5 or the resistance at 5 hertz which is significantly increased the normal value is around 100 and once you give bronchodilators to this child it improves significantly so there is a 42% change in the r5 values post bronchodilators which tells us that this child definitely has obstruction and reversibility even when the child had a normal spirometry so it is actually something what is known as or described as small airway dysfunction in children with asthma now children have uh, or younger children have uh, again a step ladder from gina so it goes from step 1 which is an infrequent wheezer and no interval symptoms only sos treatment is required now as you go on to step 2 so the the symptom pattern is more consistent with asthma so as if you remember the 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 table which i had shown symptoms are is in the middle one or the right side and asthma symptom doesn't seem to be well controlled or the child does not fall into a, a symptom pattern which is consistent with asthma but the child keeps on having frequent episodes of wheeze so child has one episode in september then october then november and december so even if this child appears to be like an like a volary this child deserves prophylaxis to improve the quality of life and hence this child should be on step 2 which is daily low dose inhaled corticosteroids now if this child doesn't seem to be doing well and you do not have any alternate differential diagnosis then you might switch on to step 3 which is doubling the low dose inhaled corticosteroids if you have started something like 100 microgram of bupropionate air you can shift this child to 200 microgram of bupropionate and even if this child is still not improving then you go on to the step 4 which requires an expert opinion to rule out alternate differential diagnosis and see why this child is not getting better 
Now, once you have done all these things and you you have followed up Rim Jim for for a longer period of time, for approximately six months to a year, you'll be able to classify her severity. So now the classification of severity is not based on the current symptoms. Rather, they are based on the amount of medicine which is needed to give them a good control. So if a child needs low-dose inhaled corticosteroids for a good control, then despite the frequency or severity of symptoms, the child would be classified as mild. So as you can see, Rimjim had very bad symptoms initially, but finally Rimjim could go on to low-dose inhaled corticosteroids and was remaining well. So even if the presentation tells us that she might need a higher dose, she has settled down at a low dose in ale corticosteroid and we would still label it as a mild form of persistent asthma. Now let's come to the core topic that when do you label a child as problematic severe asthma? So any school aged child who requires at least 800 mic microgram of an ale corticosteroids, which is butacinide equivalent and has undergone a trial of at least two of the three additional controllers. So 800 micrograms of inhaled corticosteroids. And in addition, the child requires or has undergone a trial of two or three controllers in addition. So that is LABA, so that's your formatrol or salmetrol, has, has got a, a trial with LTRAs, that is your Montelukast, and oral theophylline and still has symptoms, right? And these symptoms would fall in either of these categories. So persistent chronic symptoms with a poor quality of life. So daily cough, daily bees, daily breathlessness. Acute severe exacerbations with or without associated interval symptoms. So you've given high uh, moderate dose inhaled corticosteroid plus LABA plus Montelukast and still the child gets four or five exacerbations a year. In one of these exacerbations, the child is admitted and might get admitted to an ICU. So this child is not doing well. Then persistent airflow obstruction following a steroid trial. So you've given steroids, the child responds, but on the lung function, the child shows a persistent obstruction or the child needs alternate daily doses of steroids or alternate days of steroids. So these are the scenarios when you would consider this particular child as a problematic severe asthma. Now this problematic severe asthma includes four types of children, right? So one could be, it is actually not an asthma. So you're not dealing with asthma, but an alternate differential diagnosis and we are going to talk about it in the next slides. So not asthma at all. The other could be that the child has an asthma plus, which means the additional comorbid conditions, which is not letting the asthma settle down, right? As Rimjim had. The third could be that it is difficult to treat. Why it is difficult to treat? Because she is not getting proper treatment, right? And the fourth, which is the most uncommon of all these would be a true therapy resistant asthma. And even this term is changing because therapy resistant asthma, now you have a lot of therapies for resistant asthma. So even this term is now going to fade off. And usually you have a combination of an asthma plus and a difficult to treat situation because of the compliance adherence and the technique related issues. That is what Rimjim had. Now let's go on to to what we were talking on here that not asthma at all. So you have a list of differential diagnosis or atypical wheezers or mimickers, which can present with similar symptoms, but they are actually not asthma. So they could be things like infections, which can be recurrent LRTIs, bacterial bronchitis, suppurative lung disease and bronchiectasis. So this is one group of condition which can present with these symptoms. You can have symptoms of tuberculosis, you can have chronic rhinitis, sinusitis, adenoid hypertrophy, and a bronchiolitis obliterans. So these are conditions which can present with uh, Vs, but they're actually not asthma. Then you can have congenital problems like tracheomalacia, bronchomalacia, you can have things like cystic fibrosis, 
bronchopulmonary dysplasia, ciliary dyskinesia. And you can have things like immune deficiency, which can present like this. Then airway compressions because of vascular or non-vascular airway compressions. Each type of tracheoesophageal fistula. So congenital problems are definitely on, and especially in young children, they are quite important. And then we can have mechanical problems like gastroesophageal reflux disease or the GERD and foreign body aspiration. And believe me, we do see all of these things in clinical practice. So each and every diagnosis we have seen a multiple times. So be careful about atypical visors or mimickers. We do understand that it is a long list of differential diagnoses. and it's not easy to take them on. Right, but at least we should know how to, you know, pick up that odd man out, out of those fifty patients which you might be seeing a day. So, I'll just give you two examples showing two clinical cases. So this is an old case of ours, a twelve years old boy who presented to the ENT department. Why ENT department? Because this child had a chronic nasal obstruction and nasal discharge for the past three or four years. On examination, had a nasal turbinate hypertrophy with a nasal discharge. So the ENTs got a CT, and the CT was showing a lot of sinusitis. So pan sinusitis involving the maxillary sinuses and the other sinuses as well. So it was a pan sinusitis, and the child doesn't seem to be improving. So they had planned this child for a functional endoscopic, uh, functional endoscopic sinus surgery. So how did we get into the picture? So when this child went to anesthesia for a pre-anesthetic checkup, they found this child has been wheezing. So this child was referred to pediatrics. So once we reviewed the history, uh, there was a persistent nasal discharge, there was nasal obstruction, and there was a chronic cough and possibly a chronic wet cough. Now, this child did not have any severe exacerbations, aeroallergen sensitization, atopic dermatitis, any GRD symptoms, and no family history of AOP or asthma. So similar ENT findings, nothing else we could find. There was a bilateral polyphonic wheezing. So we also kept the diagnosis as asthma with rhinosinusitis. But this child was, wasn't improving with the asthma treatment which we had given, but why? So we had done a lung function. Again, you can see lung function shows a mild obstruction, scooping of the curve, low FEV1 by FVC values, and but no significant reversibility. So that's a bit fishy, but we thought let's treat it as asthma and let's see. And this child has three X-rays. So have a good look at these X-rays. And what do you think these x-rays are telling us? So a bit of hyperinflation in all these x-rays. They appear slightly more black. And this diaphragm seems to be flattened on both sides. Anything else? Well, we missed a lot of things in this x-ray. And that is what we had missed. So if you look at these x-rays carefully, then the marker was actually on the wrong side. It should be on the right side. So this child actually had dextrocardia, which we had missed. And dextrocardia with all these symptoms, or as situs inverses with all these symptoms, point towards the diagnosis of a primary ciliary dyskinesia or Cartagner syndrome. So this was an asthma mimicker which we had seen. So be careful about things. They, they do come our way. Now, you can have situations like this as well. So this is a young child who is around six years of age, six months of age. And this child has been having noisy breathing for the past six, past six months. So since birth, the child has not been well. Uh, and has been on nebulization on most days of the month but no response, no hospital admissions. Something different going on, noisy breathing since birth, 
no response to nebulization. So let's see this video and I hope I can play it for you. Okay. Look at the respiratory Yes. Okay, so uh, this child has a noisy breathing and this is possibly since birth. So we are possibly dealing with some congenital issue uh, which has been masquerading as asthma. And if you look at this child carefully, then otherwise the child is well, but the child has some expiratory noise, fine. So noisy breathing could be in the form of a strider, which is something like, <gasps> So it is not like that. It is an expiratory sound like this. So this is a, a typical expiratory wheezing or a monophonic wheezing which was heard. So we were possibly dealing with some tracheal issue. So we went ahead and we thought that this child possibly requires a bronchoscopy to look at tracheal compressions. And I'll just play this, this video for you. So this is the flexible bronchoscopy, which we did. And as you can see, this is the anterior tracheal wall. This is the posterior tracheal wall. And in between, you find that the trachea is actually collapsing. So hardly any space can be seen here. And as I go down, you will be able to see the carina and, and the trachea. So you can see the posterior tracheal wall, the anterior tracheal wall is, is almost approximating and you can't find any space here. Now, as we are going down towards the, the, the carina, we'll be able to visualize the bronchus. So you can see the left main bronchus here. You can see a left main bronchus here, but you still can't see a right main bronchus because of the tracheal compression, which is, which is more on the right side. And as I go down, you can now see the right main bronchus and the left main bronchus. So right main bronchus, well seen, no compression here, right intermediate bronchus and the right upper lobe bronchus. And as I turn to the left side, the left, the left bronchus also appears to be normal. So it is a tracheal compression, which is not varying with the respiration, which is not dynamic. What are the causes? So the usual cause in this age group is a vascular airway compression. So we did a CT angiography. And what we find here is that this is the right aortic arch and this is the left aortic arch. So it is a double aortic arch and in between the two arches, you have the trachea and the esophagus which are compressed. And most of these children will have some symptoms associated, uh, some esophageal symptoms associated. So usually they would have some amount of dysphagia in between. So be careful about congenital lesions. Right, so let's go on and, and see the theoretical background regarding these. So if you have a child who presents to you with a difficult asthma, the step one is to confirm a diagnosis and, and, and look at differential diagnosis, which we have just talked about. Then you look at the contributing factors to symptoms, exacerbation and poor quality of life. So you have to go back and drill down the whole history and examination again and again and see what we are missing at. And then you try to optimize treatment. You optimize the technique, deal, at, deal adherent issues, treat, treat, more, uh, treat the comorbid conditions, and you might need to step up treatment as we had done for remission. Right, so once the child presents with this, you have to go from step one to step three. Now, once you have done this, you review the child in your clinic for the next three to six months and assess the response. And 
after doing all this if the child is still not well then you can label this child as a severe asthma or a therapy resistant asthma so any child who presents to you today cannot be labeled as a therapy resistant asthma or a severe asthma you have to follow this child up for the next few months look at all the things which we have talked about in the presentation today and after 3 to 6 months of treatment you would be in a position to to clearly say whether this child responds to the therapy or not despite these adequate steps so if this child is not responding now now you have to phenotype this this child to the side treatment so we need an feno or an exhaled nitric oxide blood and sputum eosinophil skin prick test or an immuno cap to look at what's going on is it an ige mediated asthma or not now as you go on and assess this child we have to look at type 2 inflammation or the eosinophilic inflammation so how do you judge that so blood eosinophil is one marker uh you can have an feno of more than 20 or sputum eosinophils of more than 2% or asthma you find is clinically allergen driven so these are the indicators which tells you that the it is a type 2 inflammation or an eosinophilic type of asthma which you are dealing with so now you can divide your children with severe asthma into two groups eosinophilic and non eosinophilic so even at this step or, or what is known as a step 6a we are still going to optimize treatment look at the adherents again because there would be a lot of patients who despite being severe are not adherent to treatment and you can use smart inhalers and one of the devices is now available even in india so these smart inhalers can trace each and every dose which has been taken by the patient in a digital form try high dose inhaled corticosteroid for 3 to 6 months consider using tiotropium and we are just going to talk about tiotropium in the next slide consider a possibility of grd bronchopulmonary aspergillosis rhinitis sinusitis and treat an atopic dermatitis if, if it is there now in non eosinophilic patients the rest of the things remain the same you might try macrolides and if the child is actually behaving like non eosinophilic then you should be more digging into the differential diagnosis and considering a ct chest a bronchoscopy in new sputum because you might be dealing with a bronchiectasis and hence this child is not showing the correct phenotype now tiotropium is basically an anticholinergic drugs which can be used for children more than 6 years of age and adults with poorly controlled asthma and it is currently an option for step 4 and step 5 of gina and there have been long large randomized control trial with childhood difficult to treat asthma and it has been a good add on it improves lung function it decreases the risk of exacerbation and slows the worsening of disease and we have some amount of data in 1 to 5 years as well but in less than 6 years of age it is still an off label use how does tiotropium act so uh, the mechanism of action appears to be complex but it has it has to deal with modulation of bronchomotor tone inhibition of smooth muscle remodeling inhibition of th2 cytokine release emission uh, inhibition of chemotactic mediators eosinophilic recruitment modulation of coplet cells and increase in cough threshold so you can read about tiotropium if you if you feel you are interested in this and these are the key trials which are there i'll not go into details because of the paucity of time and we have meta analysis also which are published so in 2017 we have meta analysis of of tiotropium in school age children and we have safety data in children 1 to 5 years as well so once you're done with 6a you have classified your child and still the child doesn't seem to respond it it breaks into two arms the first would be that can the family afford or do they have an access to biological treatments so that is your malizumab and rest of the drugs so that is the anti ig and we'll just going to talk about it or that is not available not possible then you can optimize again and see whether you can add on a laba 
tyrotropium or put this child on low dose oral corticosteroids on alternate days to maintain this child now the step 6b is basically for biologicals so what what do we have which is available to us so pomalizumab has been there for the past many years you need to have a, a perineal allergen sensitization before you embark on pomalizumab uh it has to have that ige range in the weight range and a specified number of exacerbation in the last year only then a malizumab can be used then you have something new which is available which is known as an anti il5 uh, antagonist which is known as mepolizumab which is now available in india and european agencies have cleared it for more than 6 years of age it can be used for neosinophilic asthma and we also have dupulimab which is also approved which is an anti il4 r antagonist now again you can titrate your response if it is a good response you reevaluate gradually reduce the number of drugs but keep the child still on inhaled corticosteroids after a period of a, of a few months or a year try and withdraw the biologicals and maintain this child on low dose inhaled corticosteroids for poor response the options are not very good some people are still considering bronchial thermoplasty but we do not have data as of now in especially for children so let's conclude with our take home messages that most children with difficult to treat asthma are due to a combination of faulty basic steps and comorbid conditions as we have seen a systematic approach will help to sort out most of these children do remember that all that wheezes is not asthma you still need to look at the differential diagnosis so am i sure this child has asthma is there nothing else which is going on and a small number of children have truly a severe asthma and they require an expert opinion so when do we need to refer a particular child with asthma to an expert so three conditions if you find a difficulty in confirming the diagnosis so if you feel it is a suppurative lung disease cystic fibrosis celiac dyskinesia or tropical pulmonary eosinophilia but you are not sure about it you want to further investigation even unclear diagnosis after a trial of inhaled corticosteroids so if given inhaled steroids but this child doesn't respond now you feel that you might be dealing with alternate diagnosis it can be a vocal cord dysfunction or something else which is going on then a persistent uncontrolled asthma or frequent exacerbations so this child doesn't maintain well at step 4 of treatment and you have sorted out rest of the issues like technique compliance adherence and so on and this child reserves a referral and this child if has risk factors for asthma related deaths so near fatal asthma or pico admission or ventilation so these are the indications of referring a child to a expert so we end by just by enumerating what services we provide at our hospital and at our clinic <clears throat> so we are providing bronchoscopies for all ages we do bronchoscopic extraction of foreign bodies with the flexible scope lung functions including uh, oscillometries for young children sweat chlorides video fluoroscopic swallows then allergy testing and sleep studies so i end here uh, my talk and i would hand over to dr abbas 